Good morning, Team Alabama. We are ready for Chapter 4, the second half, and we are on page 34. Please join me in reading on your Chromebook along with me. Page 34, second paragraph. It took an hour, perhaps two. He could not measure time yet and didn't care for the sun to get halfway up. With it, with it came some warmth, small bits of it at first, and with the heat came clouds of insects, thick swarming hordes of mosquitoes that flocked to his body. Hordes would be a great vocab word you could add. A massive amount, hordes, lots of them. Made a living coat on his exposed skin. They clogged his nostrils, his nose, and when he inhaled, he, they poured into his mouth when he opened it to take a breath. It was not possibly believable, not this. He had come through the crash, but the insects were not possible. He coughed them up. He spat them out. He sneezed them out. He closed his eyes and kept brushing his face, slapping and crushing them by the dozens, by the hundreds. But as soon as he cleared a place, as soon as he killed them, more came. Thick, whining, buzzing masses of them. Mosquitoes and some small black flies that he had never seen before, all biting, chewing, and taking from him. In moments, his eyes were swollen shut and his face puffy and round to match his battered forehead. He pulled the torn pieces of his windbreaker over his head and tried to shelter in it, but the jacket was full of rips and it didn't work. In desperation, he pulled his t-shirt up to cover his face, but that exposed the skin of his lower back and the mosquitoes and flies attacked the new soft flesh of his back so viciously that he pulled the shirt down. In the end, he sat with the windbreaker pulled up, brushed with his hands, and took it, almost crying in frustration and agony. It, agony is like extreme pain. There was nothing left to do, and when the sun was fully up and hitting him directly, bringing steam off of his wet clothes and bathing him in warmth, the mosquitoes and flies disappeared. Almost that suddenly, one minute he was sitting in the middle of a swarm, the next they were gone and the sun was on him. Vampires, he thought. Apparently they didn't like the deep of night, perhaps because it was too cool and they couldn't take the direct sunlight. But in the gray time in the morning, when it began to get warm and before the sun was full up and hot, he couldn't believe them. Never in all the reading in the movies he had watched on television about the outdoors, never once had they even or ever mentioned the mosquitoes or flies. All they ever showed on the naturalist shows was beautiful scenery or animals jumping around having a good time. Nobody ever mentioned mosquitoes and flies. Ugh. He pulled himself up to stand against the tree and stretched, bringing new aches and pains. His back muscle must have been hurt as well. They almost seemed to tear when he stretched. And while the pain in his forehead seemed to be abating or leaving somewhat, just trying to stand made him weak enough to nearly collapse. The backs of his hands were puffy and his eyes were almost swollen shut from the mosquitoes and he saw everything through a narrow squint. Not that there was much to see, he thought, scratching the bites. In front of him lay the lake, deep blue and deep. He had a sudden picture of the plane sunk in the lake, down and down in the blue, with the pilot's body still strapped in the seat, his hair waving. He shook his head, more pain. That wasn't something to think about. He looked at his surroundings again. The lake stretched out slightly below him. He was at the base of the L, looking up the long part with the short part out to his right. In the morning light and calm, the water was absolutely perfectly still. He could see the reflections of the trees at the other end of the lake. Upside down in the water, they seemed almost like another forest, an upside down forest to match the real one. As he watched, a large bird, he thought it looked like a crow, but it seemed larger, flew from the top real forest and the reflection bird matched it, both flying out over the water. Everything was green, so green it went into him. 
The forest was largely made up of pines and spruce with stands of some low brush smeared here and there and thick grass and some other kind of very small brush all over. He couldn't identify most of it except the evergreens and some leafy trees that he thought might be aspen. He'd seen pictures of aspens in the mountains on television. The country around the lake was moderately hilly, but the hills were small, almost hummocks, and there were very few rocks except to his left. There lay a rocky ridge that stuck out overlooking the lake about 20 feet high. If the plane had come down a little to the left and would have hit the rocks and never made the lake, he would have been smashed, destroyed. The word came. I would have been destroyed and torn and smashed, driven into the rocks and destroyed. Luck, he thought. I have luck. I had good luck there, but he knew what that was wrong. If he had had good luck, his parents wouldn't have divorced because of the secret. And he wouldn't have been flying with a pilot who had a heart attack, and he wouldn't be here where he had to have good luck to keep from being destroyed. If you keep walking back from good luck, he thought, you'll come to bad luck. He shook his head again, wincing. Another thing not to think about. The rocky ridge was rounded and seemed to be of some kind of sandstone with bits of darker stone layered and stuck into it. Directly across the lake from it and at the inside corner of the L was a mound of sticks and mud rising up out of the water a good eight or ten feet. At first, Brian couldn't place it, but knew that he somehow knew what it was. He had seen it in the films. Then a small brown head popped to the surface of the water near the mound and began swimming off down the short leg of the L, leaving a V of ripples and beyond, and he remembered where he'd seen it. It was a beaver house called a beaver lodge in a special that he'd seen on the public channel. A fish jumped, not a large fish, but it made a big splash near the beaver. And as if by a signal, there were suddenly little splops all over the sides of the lake along the shore as fish began jumping. Hundreds of them jumping and slapping the water. Brian watched them for a time and still in a half daze, still not thinking well. The scenery was very pretty, he thought, and there were new things to look at, but it was all a green and blue blur and he was used to the gray and black of the city traffic and people talking and sounds all the time and the hum and the whine of the city. Here at first it was silent, or he thought it was silent, but when he started to listen, really listen, he heard thousands of things, hisses and blurks, small sounds, birds singing, hum of insects, splashes from the fish jumping. There was a great noise here, but a noise that he did not know and the colors were new to him, and the colors and noises mixed in his mind to make a green-blue blur that he could hear and hear as a hissing pulse sound, and he was still tired, so tired, so awfully tired, and standing had taken a lot of energy somehow, had drained him. He supposed he was still in some kind of shock from the crash, and there was still the pain and dizziness, the strange feeling. He found another tree, a tall pine with no branches, until the top and sat with his back against it, looking down on the lake with the sun warming him. And in a few moments, he scrunched down and was asleep again. Okay, we're going to stop there. Have a great rest of your day, Team Alabama. You might want to add a few more facts to your 50 fact Google Doc if you have some questions that you want to ask yourself. What are some things that he's going to need to start thinking about? Okay, you might ask yourself about that. What does he need to take care of? He's just sitting out there in the middle of nowhere. What are some new things he's going to need to start worrying about? Have a great rest of your day.